what? There's a uh, gospel singer by the name of Willie Neal Johnson. And he used to have a song called, Lord, I Thank You. He'd say, uh, I'm on my way to heaven. You can't turn me around to see Jesus and to get my crown. My way is hard every day, but when it's all over, I'll get my way. And so he said, Lord, I thank you. And I'm telling you what, church, we have a lot to be thankful for. Amen. We have a lot to be thankful for that, that no matter where you are at in, in your life, we have a God who's there for you. I'm thankful that week after week, God continues to bless us as a church. Amen. Bless us with baptisms and salvations and new members. I'm, I'm thankful that God has allowed me to wake up this morning to, to, to preach this message to you. There's no greater message to proclaim to sinners in need of a Savior about who my Jesus Christ is. Amen. And uh, for that, I, I take, uh, I'm telling you, it's just a good honor for me. So uh, I'm thankful for what God is doing. And uh, it's just, a, I'm telling you, I just, I'm overwhelmed every single Sunday that I walk into this church. And to see the support that you guys have given this church and the support that uh, God has blessed us with, it's just, it's a blessing. Uh, on Monday... Mr. Dave asked if I'd help him split some wood. And I said, well, I see my reputation has preceded me. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Don't let the suit fool you. I'm a country boy at heart. And so uh, I said, of course I'd help. And, uh, <laughs> and Dave was there. Andrew was there. Mark Brandon was there. Mark just had a uh, shoulder replacement. It was a replacement. Shoulder, he, had, he had a shoulder replacement. So he was no help. <laughs> Andrew hasn't worked a day in his life. <laughs> he was no help. They started getting a bad back halfway through, so guess what? He was no help. So that left me and Grandpa Steve. Grandpa Steve drove the tractor. Y'all know I'm telling the truth here. I had to take the wood off the truck. Next thing I know, I'm having to split the wood. Next thing I know, I'm having to put the wood back in the bucket of the tractor. And old Grandpa Steve would drive that thing back somewhere, I don't even know, it would just disappear and he'd come back with an empty bucket. And I did that for hours, it felt like. And, uh, you know, Dave said, hey, I didn't know you worked so hard. I said, buddy, I did not get to this point in my life with just my good looks. I have one speed. And y'all can either jump on board with the speed I'm at or get off. The speed never slows down. <laughs> Which is my is my leeway into race day Sunday. See how I did that? Speed. We gotta start putting a pedal to the metal, church. All right? Stop slowing down so much. We need to put the pedal to the metal. If you have your Bibles, I literally just want to talk about today. That's the only reason I told that story. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the Hebrews chapter 12. We're gonna be looking at verses 12 through 17. Hebrews chapter 12, 12 through 17. In the beginning of this chapter, we're told to run the race that is set before us. We're told that we can overcome the struggles and the sufferings that this world tries to throw our way. The reason we can endure those hardships is because of what, of what Christ has already done for us. The reason we can deal with the struggles, the reason we can run our race is because of what Christ did for us already on that cross. Have you ever heard that saying, put the pedal to the metal? I love it. Put the pedal to the metal. We got to start putting the pedal to the metal and stop worrying about what's around us. We have to stop worrying about what other churches are doing. We have to stop worrying about what other, other Christians are doing. We got to put the pedal to the metal and start running our race. And that start, here's something that people don't realize. They don't have side mirrors. Right? They have a little rear view mirror inside, but they barely use it. They don't have any side mirrors. And so what they have to have is what we call spotters. And these spotters will get to the highest point of the racetrack and they'll get a, a binocular and they'll have a radio and they'll literally tell the driver about everything that's around them. They'll talk about all the cars that are around them. They'll tell them if they should go high or if they should go low. They'll tell them if they should speed up or slow down. And they'll literally tell them anything and everything that they have to do on that racetrack. Thank God for spotters. You know? It allows the driver not to get worried about what they can't see because the spotter has it. And so all they have to worry about is that finish line. All they have to worry about is that checkered flag. As Christians that are running this race that we call life, so many people are distracted and worried about things that they cannot see. We cannot see them. 
and it distracts us on our race. And so we miss the victory and the blessings that God has right in front of our noses. I'm telling you, it's time we put the pedal to the metal and let God be our spotter. If we just run the race that God wants us to run and run it the way that he wants us to run it, I'm telling you, he will turn a, a tragedy to a blessing. He'll turn defeat into victory. So let's all stand for the reading of this holy word. Hebrews chapter 12, 12 through 17. Hebrews 12, 12 through 17. It says, Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. Make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is impaired may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and the holiness without which one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes uh, short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That there be no sexually immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, he wanted to inherit a blessing. He was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. May God bless the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. Race Day Sunday is one of my favorite Sundays, right? Not only is it the beginning of a NASCAR season, which I love, I get my afternoon naps back where I get to just turn on the race and fall asleep to the beautiful sounds of, of a, an engine, a car. You know what I'm saying? I love it, because I'm a man. And uh, I love it. But it's also a, a great Sunday because if you look at the Bible, there are many places where they talk about how our, our Christian walk, our Christian life, is like a race, where they equate our, our Christian life to an athlete. And for me, it's such a wonderful illustration to be able to help people understand how you should live your life. If it was good enough for the early apostles to use it for an illustration, guess what? It's good enough for Abram Crowley. They were having race day Sundays 2,000 years ago. Did y'all realize that? This ain't nothing new. So here, here, here in this passage that we're looking at this morning, God gives us a blueprint in how we need to run the race that God has set before us. And it starts off with, therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. One of the, one of the things that I, that I don't know that's inspiring, that's encouraging about uh, NASCAR is, is the fact that they are in a constant battle. For four hours, if they go round and round and round and round on that track, they're in a constant battle. They're fighting against the car. They're fighting against one another. They're getting beat up and, and banged up. And here's the thing about it. They continue to fight. Why? Because they want to get to that trophy at the end of that race. They want to cross that, that, that checkered flag, and they want to be able to say that they, they did something. And, and by the end of the race, those drivers, you can just see the relief and the exhaustion that they have at the end of, of the race. As Christians, we have to stay in the race. There's going to be battles that are going to come our way. There's going to be arguments and struggles. But I'm telling you, as Christians, we have to stay the course, and we have to run the race. Because guess what is waiting for us at the end of, of our race? That's Jesus Christ. So we need to keep our eyes fixed on the prize. And there's so much that has to go into these drivers driving on a, on a Sunday afternoon. There's so much that they have to pay attention to in order to be successful as, as a race car driver. And so in our life, we have to pay attention to things as well. We have to pay attention to our, our spiritual life. We have to do some self-evaluation on a daily basis. Do you realize that? I was having a meeting this week with a pastor of, of a church in Kentucky. And they run about 1,200 people each week. And I said, boy, we'll be there in about a couple years. Just give me, give me some time. Uh, our church will be there. And uh, I was talking about, we, we have two baptisms a day. And he was like, yeah, that's awesome. We're, we're doing nine baptisms. I was talking about Thursday. He was like, we're doing nine baptisms, but it's only Thursday. And I said, what do, you mean, what do you mean it's only Thursday? He's like, oh, no. My church shares their faith so much that I, I promise you it will change by Sunday. I was like, man, I wish, I wish my church would share their faith so much that I wouldn't know how many people I'd be baptizing by Sunday, you know, on Thursday. But it was cool. But he was saying, even though he has a, a successful church and he's a successful pastor, you know, he has everything seen going right in his life. He says he still has to do a checklist every week. He has to evaluate his spiritual life. And so he has like three things that he always goes back to to make sure that he's, you know, doing the right things in his life. I, I think, I don't know what the three things were. I, I would assume sharing your faith. You know, spend time in God's Word and spend time with your family. And so if he didn't get one of those, if he doesn't do all three of those things in a week, right, he will consider that week an incomplete week. I thought, man, you know, with all the stuff that he has going on, he has three things that he knows that he has to do. He has to evaluate himself to make sure that he has a complete 
week. At what point, church, are we going to start doing that in our own life? What point are we going to sit there and go, I have to evaluate where I am. I have to get to a point where I have to recognize the, the, the problems and the weaknesses in my life and constantly work at them. Here's a guy who's, who's running a huge church who has to still evaluate his life. That is something we need to do on a daily basis because guess what? When you are, are, are healing, those places in your life where you become lame, those places in your life where you are weak and feeble, I'm telling you, in, in the race of your faith, if you're doing evaluation of your life, you can heal those up. You can, you can bind those places and strengthen them. And you can keep on running, but you've got to pay attention. The problem that I see over and over again in our Christian faith is we don't strengthen the areas that are weak. We don't even attempt to, to pay attention to them. We don't even want to address them because we're so ashamed of them. We ignore it and hope it'll heal itself. But what we end up doing is we end up hurting ourselves even more. Right? To use a NASCAR analogy, what do you think would happen if these race cars had a problem and they never addressed it. Right? It'd be some really big problems. You know, they have to address the issues as soon as they as soon as they hear it. NASCAR has a, an app on, on that you can get on your phone. And it's literally, you can hear the crew chief talk to the driver. It's one of the coolest things in the world. And you get to hear all the all the things that the driver talks about to the crew chief, all the problems. And these drivers will talk about the smallest little tiny vibration. Oh, well, that doesn't feel right. Or they'll say it's really tight on one side. And you know why they tell their crew chief that? Because they understand that they, got, they have to evaluate the problems in their car or else they're going to have a bigger problem. That's the difference between a professional race car driver and somebody just driving down the street. Right? you got to know your car. I'll tell you what, the funniest thing I ever heard in my life was when Brittany was talking about Prindle. <laughs> she was talking about her Prindle, her Prindle, her Prindle. I said, what's a Prindle? I've never heard of that. You know, the Prindle in your car. I said, I've never heard of a Prindle. She's like, yeah, you know, Prindle, P-R-N-D-L, park, verse, neutral. <laughs> she calls it a Prindle. Uh, I'm like, what are you talking about? But that's the difference between a professional car. Like, these professional drivers, they know exactly what their car does at all times. In our Christian faith, you know, we got to be able to evaluate what's happening in our life to avoid a problem. We're supposed to strengthen the areas that are weak in our lives so we can endure the race that we're running. So, so where are you weak at this morning, church? Is it your prayer life? Is it, a, is, it, is it your language? Is it a sin that keeps creeping up on you every single day? Is it how you spend your free time? You can't keep ignoring it because if you don't address it, that little tiny problem will become a big problem in no time. I'll tell you what, man. I, I know people who will, will stop praying one day here. And they'll stop praying one day there. And the next thing you know, there's, there's, no, there's no prayer life at all. And not only does that hurt your spiritual life, but it hurts your physical life because you start becoming depressed and anxious and worried all the time because you're looking everywhere else for the answer when God is the great comforter. So we have to start strengthening those areas that are weak in our Christian life. We have to figure out where we're failing. We have to figure out where we're struggling. And we have to give that over to God. We have to be able to say, God, my life is filled with doubt. Help my unbelief. We need to be able to say, God, my life is filled with anger. Help my emotions. God, my, my, my life is filled with so much negativity because all I do is go on Facebook and everybody's so negative. God, help me. We have to give that over to God. We need to strengthen those places that are weak. But he also tells us in verse 13, we need a straight path for our feet. Growing up in, in a place like Falmouth, we're taught how to live differently. Right? I'm taught how to live differently growing up in Falmouth than somebody else that, like Andrew did, wasn't taught what I was taught. When I, I was taught growing up in Falmouth that you always look down when you walk, right? Because you don't want to step in cow poop. Right? That's, that's what we're taught. <laughs> Nowadays, you don't want to do that. In San, you have to look down in San Francisco because they got other stuff on the floor. <laughs> but yeah. So anyway, we were taught that. But we were also, we were also taught how to drive differently. We were taught how to drive differently. Like, we were taught how to, how to, how to drive with deer on the road. They taught me how to do that. You know? Now they don't teach that for a lot of people, but they teach that for families because we deal with deers. And so if you're if you're face to face with a deer and you're driving, you know what you're supposed to do? You're not supposed to swerve. Okay? You're supposed to hit that deer head on. <laughs> and you take it over to crouch processing. <laughs> Get you some deer jerky. No, but they go, do whatever you do, don't swerve, because our, our, our human reaction is to swerve. But the thing, the problem is, you're going to do more damage if you swerve, right? Because you're going to hit a tree that will not move. You see what I'm saying? And so they go, hit the 
the deer head on. It'll be less damage. The craziest thing in the world. But guess what? That's how we survive in Bill County. We have, we're, being, we're taught differently. And, and the, the, the thing is, uh, sometimes we feel like that's a lose-lose situation. But we have, to keep, we have to keep going straight. We have to keep going straight. Same is true with our Christian life. We have to keep going straight. There is no shortcuts when it comes to our Christian life. There is no, no, there's no easy way out. You have to stay straight. This is true with this passage. When you're running the race, there's going to be things that are going to come in your way. There's, there's going to be objects that are come, gonna, you're going to be faced with. There's going to be moments where you start to question God. But if we get off that straight path, if we decide to take that shortcut that the, that the world is trying to teach us, right, we're going to find ourselves being more hurt than we could ever imagine. When I first got married to Becky, I had this awesome Dodge Durango. It was the coolest car in the world. Dodge Durango, black on black, and I was sitting on 22s. <laughs> I, was stopping at, I was stopping at a stoplight, and somebody would pull up to the side of me, and they, they, they would motion for me to roll my window down. So I'd roll it down, and they go, that's a cool car, bro. I'm like, I know, bro. <laughs> I'm a big deal. And uh, <laughs> I love that car so much. It, it meant the world to me, this, this Durango. Because it was. It was a cool car. And uh, I was just I was a cashier at Walmart. And so I was like, I, I had the coolest car in the lot. And I was so pumped about this, man. Until I had, a, I had car problems. And so I said to my wife, I didn't have much money. I said, babe, I want to find the cheapest mechanic that I can find. To help old Betsy. And uh, I took that car to the cheapest mechanic, and the guy said, this is no problem, baby. I could do it for next to nothing. I said, you're hired. And so he fixed that thing up real quick. A couple hours later, I, I was in my car already. And so I take, it, I take it out, and I'm pumped. I'm so excited. I had old Betsy back, and I'm driving down the street, and what happens? It stops. It turns off. The engine completely shuts off. I'm like, what in the world? And so I had to get it towed back to this mechanic because I wasn't going to pay for a real mechanic. I'm going to get this guy doing it. And all of a sudden, I did this for a year. Every time I took my car to this guy, I had a bigger problem the next day. A bigger problem. A more expensive problem. Uh, next thing I know, this car was getting so expensive that I had to tell my wife that we had to get rid of it. Because I couldn't afford the, 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 all the work that had to be done to it. I tried to take a shortcut with a mechanic, and boy did I pay dear. Now I do preventive maintenance, so I keep that car up to, to stuff all the time. <coughs> In our Christian walk, there is no shortcuts. There's no way around it. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not through Joseph Smith. It's not through Buddha, right? The only way to Jesus Christ, the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Amen. So we need to stay straight on the path that God has set before us. So when you're struggling, Know that God's grace is already there. Because where I'm weak, weak he is strong. And when we keep our path straight, that's where we can find the healing. When we, when we keep our path straight, that's where we can find the, the place where God will give us the comfort. As soon as you try to do it on your own or find a shortcut, I'm telling you that limb which is lame cannot be healed. Only God can heal you if you stay the course. So we need to strengthen the places that are weak. We need to keep straight the path that, that has been set before us. And then lastly, it says here in verse 15, see to it. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. See, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up that causes trouble and, and, and might be defiled. We need to see, church. We need to see one another. We need to see one another. We need to see what others are doing. We need to see that no one is falling short of, of God's grace. We need to make sure that everybody is running the race. Do you realize that? We're supposed to be there for one another. I can list some of the, some of the people that are here right now. That, that will not tell me when something's going on in their life. I can listen, right? I'll, be, I'll call Mark. I'm like, Mark, what's going on with you, brother? How you doing? Are you all doing okay? Everything's, yeah, everything's great. I'm like, oh, that's great to hear, man. And then right as I'm about to get off the phone, he's like, but I do have an appointment on Tuesday. But no, it's not a big deal. I'm not worried about it. I'm like, no, no, no. You're supposed to let me know, Mark. I'm supposed to know this stuff. That's why y'all pay me. I get paid to worry. You don't know that? <laughs> I get paid to worry. We're supposed to share these things. We got, we got high school high school guys that, that they'll go through a breakup. And they're, they're too ashamed to go talk to their pastor about it. I'm like, guys, Becky broke my heart over and over again in high school. <laughs> I'm an expert on this kind of stuff. I'm an expert. So anyway, <laughs> in, in racing, in racing, you know, that 
there are, uh, you hear all about the driver. And, and you hear all about the driver's stat and, and, and what he's doing on and off the track. But, but, but here's the thing you have to understand. Without his team, that driver would, would be nothing. Church, with, with, without each other, we could not live this life. Right? And the author of Hebrews is encouraging us to realize that we need one another. We, we need fellowship. We, we need the church. We need support so we can stay in the race. Because we're all going to encounter difficulties in this life. We're all gonna we're all gonna do it. We're all gonna face heartaches and 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 breakups and relationships that are broken. We're all gonna face it. We need one another to help heal each other, right? So we don't drop out of the race. I think one of the most fascinating things about NASCAR is that pit crew. Without that pit crew, that driver would not be able to run that race, right? They they need. Could you imagine a, a, a driver running into the pit stall? and then unbuckling himself, getting out of the car, jacking up one side of the car, putting on the tires, you know, putting on the other tire, and going on the other side, and doing it on the other side, and then coming back and getting the gas can, and filling up the gas in his own car, and then getting back in the car, and having to buckle himself all back up, and put all the wires and all that stuff on, and then taking off and expecting to win the race? Ain't gonna happen. It's impossible. He needs a pit crew. You guys need church. You need one another. We need to be there for one another. Amen. As your pastor, I can't do it all. Our outreach team can't do it all. Our deacons can't do it all. Our trustees can't do it all. We have to be there for one another. We have to be there for one another. If you're dealing with loneliness, guess what? I can point you to somebody else who's dealing with it too. Right? That can sit there and encourage you. If you're dealing with depression, guess what? I can point to somebody in the church that is going through depression that can help you get through it. If you're, if you're dealing with a breakup, guess what? There's plenty of us that have dealt with breakups. Right? I can point you to somebody that can help you get, get through it. Right? If you've lost a spouse, guess what? There's other people in this church, probably people are sitting right next to you, that have lost a spouse too. And they can help you overcome it. We have to do everything we can to stay in the race and see to it that others do as well. When we strengthen our weak spots and we stay straight on the path that, we, that, that, that God has set before us and we see to it to take care of one another, I promise you, you will experience a life that cannot be shaken. Right? So instead of coming into the church... And, and on Sunday morning, and then sneaking out before everybody sees you, right? Share your struggles with somebody. Say, hey, could you pray for me? I'm going through this. I'm going through that. I promise you, we won't bite you. All right? We're here for one another. There is so much that has to go into drivers being able to be successful on race days. There's teams of people, from coaches to crew chiefs to pit crews, that, that make a driver successful. Church, this has to be our role. We have to be able to, to be like a, a race team when it comes to one another, right? You have the crew chief in your life encouraging you, getting a game plan to move forward with your spiritual life. Guess what? That's the job of the pastor. That's my job. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to help you get a game plan together for the week. This has to be a, a, my, my, my part. Then you have pit crews, right? These amazing pit crews who, you know what a pit crew does? They sit there and they wait on that pit wall until somebody pulls up. When their car pulls up, they are ready with anticipation to jump out there and start filling that car up that's on empty. You know, they, they have these, uh, on, on the race car windshield, they have all these little, tiny, little, uh, uh, little, I don't even know what they are, little, little pieces of glass. I don't know. They just rip it off, and it's a brand new windshield, it looks like. Tons of these. Guess what? There's people that come in here, and they can't see because life has been splattered on them like a bug on a windshield. That's what church is for. Our, our church should be like the pit crew, waiting with anticipation for the, the, the hurt and the need to walk into those doors so we can sit there and help fill them up with encouragement. That's what we need to be doing for each other. And then you have, you have engineers. This is something that's really important. They, they have engineers back at home. They have blueprints back at home on how to make the car, how to build the car, all the nuts and bolts of the car, so that by the time they get to the racetrack on Sunday, that car is built and it's perfect and it's ready to rock and roll. Guess what, church? When you go home today, you should have God's word right there. Right, as a blueprint to help you with the nuts and bolts of your life, the nuts and bolts of your spiritual life. Right? That that has to be what, what we focus on is God's holy word throughout the week. And then lastly, you have to have a spotter who is constantly in your ear, telling you what to look out for, where to turn, which direction you want to be heading, to avoid the potential crashes in front of you. That spotter in our life has to be Jesus Christ. He has to be there. Tell you what to look for, tell you what to worry about. Right? And here's the thing, when I preach on this passage, every time I go to Hebrews, I don't know what it is. I can always feel the devil just working so hard to fight the spirit that's in the church. I've always, it's always happened. 
just fighting so hard to, to fight the Spirit. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If you know you're saved today, will you start praying for that person next to you? You don't know their heart. God does. So pray for them. If you're sitting here today and, and, and you know in your heart that you're not saved, it's time to wake up to what God is trying to reveal to you. Wake up to who he is. Because here's, here's the thing. Listen to how this passage ends. This, this passage, how this passage ends gives me nightmares. This scares me because I see so many people do the same thing. Because the Bible says that Esau got to such a place that even though he broke down in tears, with, with tears in his eyes, he found no place of repentance. Some of you guys are living in such sin that you're not ashamed of it anymore. You're, you're living in such sin, in a sin that you're not ashamed of. And you may find yourself crying out to God, but do you really mean it? Do you really mean it? You're sitting there going, well, I see it every Sunday. You come up, oh, hey, everybody, oh, this is going on in my life. This is going on in my life. And I go, what are you going to do to, what are you going to, do to change it? I don't, want to, I don't want to explain that to people. I don't want to change it. I just want God to fix it. Well, listen to me. You have to get to a place of repentance. You have to, you have to cut that sin out of your life. Right? But the problem is, you would rather walk out of here knowing that you're not saved than have to explain to your spouse why, why you went forward today. You, you'd rather walk out of here knowing you're not saved than have to explain to your family members or, or your friends of uh, why you're having to get rebaptized. Right? Because the first time you know you, 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 your heart wasn't in it. You'd rather walk out of these doors today and knowing that you're not saved than have to sit there and go on social media and say, you know what? I've been living a lie this whole time. I, I've called myself a Christian, but there was nothing about me that was Christian, and I'm ready to surrender my life to God. You're, you're more ashamed of that than you are giving your life over to God. It, it's, it's shameful. Let me tell you, church, do not wait for the doctor to tell you you got cancer before you get right with God. Don't wait until that family member who preaches to you day in and day out, don't wait for them to pass away before you go, all right, I need to actually get right with God. Right? D don't wait for, for an appointment with Abel Crozier, right, to talk to me in private before you get right with God. You have to sit there and make that decision for yourself. The Bible says whoever's name is written in the book of life will have eternal life. If your name is not written in the book of life, guess what? You're going to be thrown into the eternal lake of fire. That is the reality of life. And, and the sad part is, you think Aiden Crozier is going to answer for you when that day comes. I'm not. I can't answer for you. I can't answer for you today. I can't answer for, for what you're doing in your life today. That's something you have to sit there and, and, and repent of in your own life. That's something you have to confess in your own life. The day is coming where you're going to have to stand before God. And God's either going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Or he's going to say, I have no idea who you are. Depart from me. I don't want anybody to ever hear those words. Not even my worst enemies, I don't want them to hear those words. I want everyone to be able to say, all right, I did my part. I ran my race. I endured the hardships. And I, I did it with the people I loved around. Right? I shared my faith. Even when I got rejected, I continued to share my faith. I can tell you this much. When that day of judgment comes, you cannot talk your way out of it. You can't fake your way out of it. Right? Your heart will be revealed right then and there. What's it going to say about you? Is it going to say that you've surrendered your life to God and, and that the blood of Jesus Christ is all over your life? Or are they going to say, look, your life has been more devoted to the devil than it has been to God? We have to make that decision. If you're dealing with depression, loneliness, addiction, I'm telling you what, you cannot do it your own way. You can't do it on your own. You have to come to the altar and give it over to God. We think that this altar is a place of shame. No, this is a place of repentance. This is a place where we give our, our, our all to God and say, God, I can't do it on my own anymore. So we need to start surrendering our lives. As we come to this time of invitation, if you're here today and you don't, you don't know who Jesus Christ is in your life, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if, if you're here today and you know that you're not walking the straight path that God has set before you, and you're filled with doubt, and you're filled with, with hesitation, I'm telling you, you've got to give it over to God. All you got to do is say, God, I'm ready to give my life over to you. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I need a Savior. God, I want you to save me. I want you to save me. We have to stop playing church people. We have to stop playing the Christian game. We have to recognize the opportunity that God has given. Because I'm telling you this much, what a terrible day it would be if we went face to face with God and God said, we gave you the opportunities. I gave you, the, I gave you that, that Sunday 
in February to give your life over to me. And yet you sit in your pew. And yet you refuse to accept me. I'm telling you what, church, the day was he is here for a reason. Right? You, whether you didn't, whether you didn't want to be here or not, whether whether somebody drug you here or not, I'm telling you, you're here for a reason. February 14th was created for you today. This invitation was created for you today. God made everything lined up so that you would be at this church at this moment to hear this message. So that you can surrender to Him. Are you going to take advantage of it? Let us pray. Dear Christmas Father, we know that you're moving. We know that your Holy Spirit, God, is flooding this place. God, I know that there's nothing I can say here today to change someone's life. It's only through your Holy Spirit, God. Pray, God, that today the, 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 the seed was planted. I pray, God, today that, that one who's ashamed, the one who's filled with guilt, the one who doesn't know what to do, God, I pray that today is the day they stand up Take those steps forward. They say, God, you're my all in all. Today I give my life over you. God, continue to bless this church. Continue to watch every single person that's here today. God. See, my here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray God with all my heart that they give their life over to you and experience the victory that we can only experience through you. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. And all God's people say, Amen.